You are listening to Soul Searching, your weekly program where you and I discuss all the spiritual matters that matter. I'm Tom Budge. This week, I'd like to invite you to eavesdrop on a conversation I had with Jennifer Hirsch. Jennifer is a chirologist. She's an ambassador for the craft of hand reading and the ancient knowledge of palmistry. Chirology is a dialogue therapy. In using counseling with hand reading, Jen's purpose is to teach that our hands are our unique personal guide and tool for self-inquiry, and that their forms and markings tell an accurate story about our physical, emotional, vocational, mental and spiritual preferences. She has pioneered chirology in South Africa since 1991, when she founded the Chirology Center in Johannesburg. She consults as a private hand analyst and chorology teacher and is a speaker, writer and author. Jen has often been interviewed on radio, has appeared on TV and has had many articles published in magazines and newspapers. Jen has published a groundbreaking book about fingerprints and their associated character traits. This book is called Chorology, Hand Reading, Palmistry, God-Given Glyphs, Fingerprints. Listen in as uh, Jen and I chat about this ancient craft. You know, since I was little, I had this dream of uh, being a therapist. And then life happens, as we know. And actually, I ended up uh, leaving school at a young age and so on. So that never really manifested. But through my troubled childhood, I was schlepped off to many therapists. And um, I always feel that I'm a bit of a therapist by default because that persisted into my adulthood that I continued to um, self-inquire and to um, self-analyze and so on, but with the aid of professionals, of course. And um, so there was always a sort of subtext to my life around therapy. And then I began, when I was 26, I began massaging. I was one of the first massage therapists, a straight massage therapist, shall we say, um, really to hit the scene in 1979. And I had a very busy practice and people were telling me their problems. And um, then when about 10 years later when Reiki hit the scene and it became like a consciousness around that while well, you're massaging, you're doing healing and you shouldn't really be talking, I felt a strong urge to separate the dialogue therapy from the physical therapy. And I made a decision to study something that could give me a counseling tool. And I um, went through all the ologies and I came up with the hand analysis. Well, it was palmistry in those years. And I found a teacher and that's how it sort of kicked off. I'm forever in a day watching people. Do you spend your day sort of looking at people's hands? Yeah, you, know, you cannot not. You know, once, once it becomes so part of what I do, it becomes quite problematic, you know, to almost stop myself from peering and one doesn't want to be too, you know, um, obvious about it. But somehow the nearest glance, because the hands are exuding energy, and obviously I'm going to be calibrating just the way you do with body language. It becomes sort of second nature to start, or not even, there's not even a beginning point and an end point. It just sort of happens as people are gesticulating or whatever it is. And then, of course, you've got the social situation where if I'm introduced or someone knows that I do the hand reading, then a certain, maybe 20% of people will try and hide their hands. And then the, other, the rest of them might very often offer their hands. So that's quite interesting as well. That's interesting. When most people think of palmistry, let's just use that word, they kind of think of the, the, the folds in the hands and the, the, the shape of the hands, the, the ridges and the, the grooves and so on. This is a bit more, if I understand this correctly, because from your book, I, I get the idea that it's about the shape of the hands, it's about... Uh, the the texture of the hands, the warmth, perhaps even the coolness of the hands itself. Yes, actually, does uh, much of that criteria would fall into the, into the palmistic category as well, Thomas. Mm. The thing is, though, that chirology is bringing in the fingerprints, and that would be probably aside from the counselling component, which we've covered. But I would say that the fingerprints, the dermatoglyphics, I call them glyphs for short, as you as per my, the name of my book. That that is really something that only started emerging in the 30s and 40s, interestingly, because you know it's almost like a blind spot. It's as if 
The old palm readers of centuries ago, or even at the turn of the century, did not even mention the fingerprint patterns. And yet now they jump out at us when we take a pair of hands and ours. You know what? The thing is, like with any other of these counseling tools, in a sense, I'd say the hands are the point of departure. So, you know, what we're looking for is a certain amount of accuracy, obviously, like to be good at it mm. and to get rapport. And then once we've established a really beautiful rapport with each other, then we get into the nitty gritty of what are the component parts of the person's life. And that's where chirology also differs from palmistry in that we have a very specific con um, like a con construct. We call it the five realms, which is really identifying the five components of every human's experience with this world. And those are the physical, the emotional, the vocational, the mental, and the spiritual. Mm. So those five realms are our cons counseling context. So that's what we really want to go in the conversation. It's not so much about this will happen, that won't happen, that did yeah. happen. So Jennifer, this program uh, is about soul searching. So how can somebody use this or consult with a practitioner in order to learn more about themselves? Well, as I mentioned, these five realms give us our context. So a person comes along and we're really taking an overview of each of the component parts of that person's life. So to give an example, let's say they present with a health vulnerability. So that would be one component part. So there'd be some dialogue, there'd be some discussion, perhaps some suggestion or reassurance when appropriate or referral when appropriate in that particular area of their life. And so it would go through each of the subcategories. It's much like coaching, essentially. Mm. So the five realms in a, you know, is more sort of linear version of the coaching wheel. So um, it just gives a lovely um, broader perspective and helps people to feel less overwhelmed by all of these parts that are, you know, every, there's so much to, to deal with in life, he said. So, uh, so that really is how it brings a certain sort of soothing quietude. It helps people to feel a little bit more comforted, a little bit getting things in perspective getting some clarity of what needs to happen next. You might buy into my belief that life is not uh, foreordained. The hand, is that not a static representation of who we are, or does the hand change in time as we change as people? Sure, Jana, this is a huge philosophical debate, actually. This is the for technical reasons, I mean, or a technical reply would be that the hand does change, or in terms of the lines, the lines can change. The shape of the hand may change under certain circumstances, aging and great weight loss or gain, things like that, or an accident, obviously. Shock perhaps can help change a hand, a shape, the basic form. But for the most part, the hand remains intact, just the, uh, and, and the glyphs, of course, remain intact forever. So if we see the glyphs as a psychological backdrop or a karmic backdrop to what the hand God deals us, so to speak, then we could say there is a predestiny. There's some sort of karmic um, imprint and that one cannot really sort of sidestep it. You can only work with it. And, um, you know, that free will is a debatable point and there's that school of thought. And then, of course, there's the other, which says, now hang on a second, you know, you create your own reality. Thoughts become form and you can really, you know, manifest whatever you so desire and... Is that school of thought? So we have to somehow try and navigate our way through this maze and um, do our best. Uh, so I suppose what's an extension question of that is that if I had a, if I consulted with you once and then uh, ten years later consulted with you again, would those readings be different? Yes, yes, most definitely, and without a doubt. Why, why so? Well, your life circumstances will have changed, so your cycle will have changed, so there'll be a different kind of emphasis. So although your, let's say, your basic character, your, your authentic temperament might remain the same, or perhaps would re remain the same, perhaps you've, for example, might have toned down on the persona. You might have toned down, because I make quite a distinction between your authentic temperament, your, your true character, and your persona. 
So there's like, you know, there's three sort of prongs of how we present in the world or how we experience ourselves in the world. And um, if you learn to work with your authentic temperament, which is the kind of mood you wake up with in the morning, they say, as an idea, mm. then, you know, to come to peace with that, to have compassion for yourself, to um, perhaps work on acquiring a more, if need be, a more kind of positive, optimistic perspective on things, whatever it is, you'd have done some work over that 10-year period and would, would like to think that you're not sort of stuck. So, uh, Jennifer, we have two hands. Uh, there's the left and the right, and uh, they just seem to be like mirror images of each other. Um, do each of that, each of the hands offer a different insight into into the person? Actually, I've never looked at your hands, Thomas. Did they? Are they a mirror image of each other? <laughs> so, no, I kind of I'm always thinking. thought that they were mirror images, but now that I look at them, they they're actually a little bit different. Yes, that's what I was thinking, probably, because most people, you'll find they're not mirror images. In fact, some people have dramatically different hands, you know, like really a completely different flow of the lines and so on, and of course, different glyphs. The two hands do have different significance. People always ask which hand do you read, and we read both hands. And if you're right-handed, we talk about right hand, the right hand being an active hand and the left hand being passive. And your passive hand will show, your left hand will show that which you hide from the, from the world and from yourself, often to some extent. So that would be perhaps your authentic temperament, the parts that you're more vulnerable, vulnerable about, um, stuff that's inherited, like um, predispositions, susceptibilities to ailments, um, formative circumstances and conditions, and so on, and then, and, and your potential, and to some extent the past. And that depends on whether we see what we call a progressional trend between the markings on your left hand if you're right-hand active and your right hand. It would reverse if you're left-hand active. Mm. And then on your right hand, it shows more of what you've done with it, what you show to the world, what you're more conscious of inside yourself, what, you, um, are, what you've what you achieved perhaps, you know, your strengths. And if you've, like, moved out of the limitations of your past or if the reverse has possibly happened where you might present with a really strong set of lines in your left hand and then your right hand showing a big mess of fine, broken lines, islands, etc., which means that somehow there's been tremendous crisis and things have devolved for you and that somehow you've not been able to use resources that were available to you. As you're talking, just completely fascinated with my hands, just the, and seeing the differences that I have in, in in the two. Is it of interest only what's inside the hand? The back of the hand is is not important. Oh, at yeah, all. the back of the hand. We look at we look at the knuckles. We look at very much the nails, of course, and the um, the rings that people might present if they're wearing rings. The rings give a lot of clues, actually. Adornment to the hand would be significant. Yes, very much so. Very, hmm. uh, very revealing, huh? Uh, how, it sounds uh, too revealing. How, how people, how people would groom themselves, how how well kept their their nails would be, and how, you know, yes, that would that, say a lot, would it? That says a lot. Hmm. I mean, people often hide behind their nails. You know, if someone's wearing a lot of false nails and lots of, you know, jewelry and so on, there's a there's a mask. Oh my goodness, that's yeah. fascinating. And if somebody, for example, wears a thumb ring, just for, you know, to take one example, that tells us that the querent is seeking spiritual comfort because the thumb is significant of our evolution to consciousness because we are the only creatures really with an evolved thumb that's usable in opposition to fingers. Mm. I mean, obviously the ape family, many of them have thumbs, but mm. not and as in quite such an evolved way as, as humans. And, and, and ring, rings are very often about identity too, I would imagine. People wear a ring on a particular finger, but it may very well indicate a proclivity to something or other. Yeah, well, look, like, you know, a ring on a ba on a air finger, a baby finger, pinky, that's quite traditionally linked to sexual orientation. Hmm. And um, it can also be put there because it's something you inherited or because you're child gave you a gift or whatever, you know, there's all sorts of reasons because it fits or because you like the look of it. But there's a signal in placing a ring on a baby finger 
that signals something to do with sexuality and financial exchange. So if you've traveled in the East, like, you know, the Central Eastern, I mean, yeah, Central Eastern countries like, say, Turkey or Israel or whatever, you'll notice that the traders, like carpet traders or whatever, were in the old part of Jerusalem, they'll wear a ring on their pinky and they're often like fiddling with it. Mm. And there's something about money exchange that also goes with that placement. So it covers that and then it covers also a third possible meaning and that is that if you place a ring on your baby finger, you don't feel heard and you're trying to express more authoritatively with your communication. It's my intuition that has to draw out the thread of what the accurate interpretation of that might be for that person. Hmm. Your forefinger, your index finger represents your authority in the world, your personal identity and the way you see yourself, the self-esteem. The middle finger represents your cultural identity, which represents your past and your sense of security and stability in the world. The ring finger represents what we call extra personal identity, which means what you have to spare. So it's your creativity, it's sportsmanship, um, it's just like energy, it's joie de vivre and so on. And then your baby finger represents, as I mentioned, the three areas, which is communication, sexual sexuality and financial exchange you know, like calluses and things where, where i guess when you type nowadays you don't get those same calluses but i if one writes a lot and i, I kind of tend to do then you can very carefully see where a pen has been held um would those be of significance or would you discount them no definitely you, you know obviously occupational um, stuff will show up, you know, if you're a golfer or whatever the case might be, you're pushing weights or whatever. So those are like palmer calluses. You know, some people ha have almost all their fingers that are quite stubby and sort of extend out to the same level. Uh, others have a very sort of zigzag pattern when you know when you look at the length of each finger, with obviously the the middle finger being the the longest of them. All of those things are significant, I guess. Oh yeah, very much. We look at the length of fingers in relation to the palm, and then we look at the length of fingers in relation to each other. And each has would break down into often many meanings. And then, of course, you're looking for how the fingers lean, how they bend, respectively, whether they bend inwardly or outwardly, and also the space between the fingers. We need some sort of system by which to interpret meanings. So the system I use is called the five element system, so what we're doing is we're seeking to define the unknown, i.e. the hand, in terms of the known being principles of the elements. So air as an element, scientifically, is obviously it's dispersive, it's non -for, it's, it, it holds no form, it's pervasive, it's detached, it's spacious, and so on. So when there's lots of space held between fingers, then the person is open. They're like a more open book. And you'll find they're more friendly, they don't have secrets, they're often quite sort of comfortable in their world if the fingers are, are, are thick, reasonably thick, and so on. So we're looking for all of that as opposed to a person who hides, you know, they, they or either hides their hands or they shy of their hands or they hold their fingers closely together, then you know that they're just more reserved and um, more private and perhaps a little bit less... Um, you know, we call them the short arms, long pockets variety, or they're less generous with money. And there's like many, many meanings with every little nuance of a set of hands. Oh, my goodness. It's a uh, beautiful study, I must say. It really, you know, you can really go very accurately into into helping people and to understand themselves. I almost like I want to sit on my hands now. Yeah. I'm like <laughs> very conscious of who would be what looking at them. If somebody wanted a, a, a consultation, um, I know that you're in the Johannesburg area, but uh, could people take photographs of their hands and send them to you? Or is this something that you would need to touch? How, how do people go about that? Oh, yes. I consult with people from all over the world. It's so wonderful from Skype, you know. So I have a set of criteria of photographs that I ask people to send me prior to the meeting. And then I do an analysis and uh, we off we go. And if people who want to see me, like consult on Skype, say, if they're in, wherever in South Africa or overseas, then, and they're up for it, they can take lipstick, like a sort of dark color lipstick, and put a very thin smear over the palmer surface and then do a set of prints. 
and even if it's a bit of a shady sort of attempt, I can at least get more clarity on the fingerprints and so on. So it's not essential. I mean, I can see on photographs quite nicely these days what's what with what, you know. I guess there have been studies of famous people. Uh, I'm sure most people have had a palm print you know, somewhere in their lives, and I, I guess if one looks hard enough, you can find them. Their lives are out there in the public domain. That correlation, I guess, would help as a convincer. You know what? There's so many hand readers that do in-depth studies of the famous hands, you know, from all the presidents through to all the actors to... You know, all these adventurers, you name it, actually, musicians, you name it. And um, I myself have a very big, extensive set of palm prints in my collection of over 4,000 people. And as you can imagine, I have met with some very well-known South Africans. You know, I've got some living legends, some of our South African living legends have got their palm prints. You know, all and sundry are open to the craft, they're open to their self-inquiry. You acknowledge in your book uh, quite a lot of help from the South African police services. How, do, uh, how does that tie in? Oh, so blessed. I just had a thing that I needed to contact them. So I wrote, I emailed the front particular head of SAP Fingerprint um, Record Center in Pretoria in those years. And I met with a, a very wonderful reception from him. I mean, I was so incredibly touched how absolutely the hospitality and the the welcoming. I mean, this is a man who's basically the um, he's a lieutenant colonel, so you can imagine he was like the top, top, top man. And um, it, it really touched my heart. And he took me through the Sunlam building where they, in those years, they had millions, literally millions and millions, I think five odd million files of palm prints of people. And he was so supportive. Of course, nowadays they scan. It's all gone into computerized systems. He offered me samples of many criminals, convicted criminals with unusual palm prints in their hands and so on. So he gave me a lot of backup and he showed up at my book launch. So I was like very chuffed, you know, and he was as chuffed that a member of the public would be interested in their, in what they do. Amazing. If people wanted to learn this craft, uh, you do teach, you do teach and you offer courses? In 2017, and I'm presenting a full year course, Chirology Practitioner Training, which will qualify people in a more in-depth way, which is going to give people a very strong and confident way to move into hand reading as a profession. And okay. you've been very generous. Thank you so much. Oh, my gosh. Lots of love to you. I was chatting to Jennifer Hirsch, a chirologist. Jen offers entertaining talks, some Skype consultations, and a superb home study training course. Please visit her website, www.godgivenglyphs.com, or you may contact her on jen at cairo.co.za. I'll have to spell that. That's jen at c-h-e-i-r-o dot co.za. I welcome your thoughts and suggestions about our show. You can always contact me by writing to this email address, studio at gaysaradio.co.za. You can also use any of the station's social media platforms, which can be found under the hashtag gaysaradio, or via the website address, which is also gaysaradio.co.za. This show is broadcast every Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m., and is available thereafter as a podcast. Thank you for listening to Soul Searching, your weekly program where you and I discuss all the spiritual matters that matter. I'm Tom Budge. Join me again next week. Goodbye.